Okay. Hi. Welcome to our class about ancestor stories. The stories have always been my favorite part of family history. And as I'm learning more, I'm realizing it's actually the most important part of family history. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And I am going to show you an example of how I have transformed a story, what was just a small story, into a more meaningful narrative or something more interesting for others to look at. So without further ado, I am just going to turn my clock on so that I don't go over time. Again, we're talking about narratives. So we're going to go a little bit more into that and what it means. So first, we're going to talk about why have stories or why are stories important in family history? Well, as I have over the years thought about this, it has just really occurred to me that if there's no one to remember or no evidence of a life accessible in this earthly world, a person ceases to exist for those who come after. And of course, a person does not cease to exist. But really, if there is no evidence of that person, if there is no one that actually knew the person, um, eventually that, that person will just fade out unless there have been meaningful and interesting narratives and records and photographs properly labeled and easily accessible. So you may have a relative a few years back that maybe you know really well, but the next generation doesn't know at all. And although you may know that person and you may have files and files about that person, let's say you have a journal and you have a family history that they wrote and you have a ton of great things about that person, but who knows what's going to happen to that after you are gone. So what if someone finds the box and throws it away? Then honestly, that person ceases to exist for, for the people that have come after. So we really don't want that to happen. And I think the thing that I want to emphasize the most in this class is it doesn't have to be fancy. Now, this is kind of what I have done is kind of an over the top process, like the example of what you would do if you're doing it all. But it's just as important if you don't have the wherewithal, the ability, the time to spend a great amount of your effort and time on, on creating narratives for ancestors, you can do something simple. And as long as it is accessible, that's so much better than nothing. So just remember that and not get overwhelmed and, and realize that it's, it's okay. So let's talk about the value of meaningful stories. And I love this. This is a study done by a family therapist, Steve, Stephen Walters. And he, he did this study on why children need to know their family history and these are four things that a child gains. And honestly, I am even going to say an adult. They did this study on children, but these are some of the benefits that I have by studying family history and creating stories. And you can too. The first one here is emotional health. Children who have a strong family narrative enjoy better emotional health. Right there is a great reason to make sure that we are sharing family stories with our future generations and even with ourselves. I have found that as I learn more about that, I, I am more calm and I enjoy life more. So I think that that is really, really amazing. Self-control is another thing that we gain that Dr. Walters has found. The more children know about their family, the stronger their sense of control over their lives and the higher their self-esteem. Amazing. So then we have history. Hearing stories gives children a sense of their history and a strong intergenerational self. And then the last one, it gives us 
and children strength. So just as you can see on this slide, this is actually, it's hard to tell, but it is a tapestry. It's a picture of a family tree that was created as a tapestry. And as we know with a tapestry or any piece of cloth, one piece of thread is weak, we can break it, but it is so much more difficult when we combine those threads and make a strong tapestry, then it's very difficult to break apart. So it gives us strength as we know more about our family. Okay, this is another study uh, done by Robin Fivish and Marshall Duke at Emory University. And some of our the missionaries that I work with have helped me to find this. I know Elder Elder Black has been really instrumental in helping me learn about this. And this is called the 20 questions. And it's a scale that they developed to tap into the benefit of, of stories and the value that stories are for children. And they found benefits of storytelling right here. We have a higher well-being, higher self-esteem, higher academic competence, higher social competence, and fewer behavior problems. Who would have thought? But that is really amazing, the benefits of stories. These are family narratives, sharing stories about our relatives and ancestors. And this is what I thought it was really interesting too. It's not the knowledge of these specific facts that's important, but it's the process of families sharing stories about their lives that is important. So we may remember stories. They may be a little off from actually what happened, but still we gain strength from those stories and a sense of community with our own, within our own family as we know more about them. So the 20 questions, they are very fun. And I'm we're not going to go through all these. These slides will be available after this class and you can go ahead and look at them or you can just Google 20 questions about family history and they usually pop up. But these are basic questions. Do you know how your parents met? Do you know where your mother grew up, where your father grew up? And then it goes into grandparents what happened when your brothers and sisters were being born? Just things, things like that. And then it goes even um, into a little bit more personal questions. Do you know which person in the family you act most like? And I like this one. Do you know about a relative whose face froze in a grumpy position because he or she did not smile enough? So those are just some questions. And I encourage all of us to go through these questions with our children and with our families to make sure that we do know that these basic things, because we all want to be smarter mentally and physically and academically, just as it's given all these promises of the things that we can benefit through. Okay. I, this is a song that was out a few years ago. It's called, I am Rosemary's granddaughter, and I'm not going to read the whole song, but I read a little write up about it. This is a song and the lyrics were written by a lady named Jessica Andrews. And she talks in this about how she may, she goes through some hard things. She has failures. She's lacks confidence, but yet in the chorus, this is where she finds her strength. And she says, I am Rosemary's granddaughter, the spitting image of my father. When the day is done, my mom is still my biggest fan. Sometimes I'm clueless and I'm clumsy, but I've got friends who love me and they know where I stand. It's all part of me and that's who I am. And I like to change that too, but I've got family who love me. And so as we learn about our ancestors' stories, we also get to know them and they get to know us. And I can say that from experience that stories bind us to the generations before us and the generations that come after. Okay, so we're talking about turning stories into narratives. So what is the difference? So I thought a long time about this. And as I searched our faithful old Google, here's what we get. A narrative is a spoken or written account of connected events, a story. And I love that. So basically we are just 
creating a story. And I love the idea that um, to me, a narrative seems a little bit more lively. It seems more exciting than just a story. And so I'm going to show you some things that I have done to turn a simple written story into a narrative. All right. So a lot of this is just my opinion and you may feel differently or as you research and find out what works for you, you may find something that uh, is totally different, but I have found that these are the three kinds of narratives that work well with family stories. One is a direct narrative, a story exactly as written or told by the author, kind of like an autobiography, maybe a memoir. So I have a lot of things that were written up or told. Maybe you'll get it from an interview. I know that many times I talked to my grandmother and I would just push my record button so that I have a direct narrative of exactly what she said. So we can have our stories in this form. And if we do, we're lucky because they are right from their mouth. The second is historical fiction. And I have quotes here um, because as I've studied, I have found that a historical fiction is set in a real place during a culturally recognizable time. Characters can be based on real people. Most facts are true, limited interpretation to create interest. So this is the genre that I have used for my family narrative, for my example, that I'm going to show you. And again, you can kind of play with that. You can have minimal interpretation, or you can have a little bit more pizzazz and um, a little bit of a wider interpretation. Um, and then the third is third person, as told by the view of someone else other than the author. So like a bi biography, someone that studied a person, or I am going to tell a story about my mother um, and I was there at the time of the event. So I'm a witness to that, or it was told to me directly as a direct narrative from the person that I'm talking about. So these are just three examples that I have used and that I have found really work well for family narratives. Okay, so here we are going to talk about, I'm going to move my little bar over. We are going to talk about, these are the, the general steps of creating a meaningful family narrative. And so I thought about seven steps. Now I'm noticing that later in this presentation, I maybe omit a step or I combine some steps, but these loosely are the seven steps that I have used. The first is to choose a story. You have to have some kind of an inspiration and a starting point. And I am going to expand upon all of these topics. So don't worry about not feeling like you don't know enough because you don't. I haven't said anything really. Uh, and then the second is to choose the narrative style you will use. So again, is it going to be that direct narrative? Is it a third person? Is it more of a um, historical narrative with a little bit of interpretation into it? So that is the style. And then we are going to put the story together as a rough draft. So you are presenting your story in the way that, that you feel that it should be presented, just kind of your first copy. And then choose the medium to use to capture your story. So what works best for you? How do you want to capture this story? And where do you want to store it? That's, that's a really important piece of what we're going to do. And then we refine and polish the story, which I have found just really takes a lot. And actually I am noticing somehow as I created this slide, <laughs> these have gotten a little bit off kilter. So I will fix them before I actually uh, submit this information, but we'll just go through them one at a time in order in my others. And then we're going to publish and share the story. And again, I'm going to talk about each of these things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to choose our subject. Now, in my experience, I have found that 
we can put a lot of work into these stories. And if I were to take, say, my grandfather's personal family history or personal history, which he hand wrote and is 150 pages, I, that would just take years and years to think about creating that into a different kind of a narrative. So I suggest picking a smaller story. So maybe just a little anecdote or something that happened in your family or just taking those and building them like bricks. If you want to do something large, instead of starting large, just do brick by brick. So it's the whole how to eat an elephant thing, just one bite at a time. And I I have found that even with a smaller story, again, it can be expanded so much that really it's much easier to start with a, a simpler subject. Okay. And so here are some ideas of things that we could use as a jumping point for our family narratives. And most of these things are items that were in my family. So I will talk a little bit about those. So first we have financial records and these are so tiny. They're hard to see. I know, but this is a financial record from my great grandfather he was a farmer and here he was talking about his livestock and what he did with his livestock, how much he paid, how much someone paid for one of his livestock. He lost one to disease. So there is so much in here that we could use as a jumping off point to make a narrative about. The second, this is my grandmother's personal history. And again, so many stories in here. And I really could do, you know, this, this actually is the direct narrative. This is exactly as my grandmother wrote it. So I would think about maybe breaking it up into a bunch of anecdotes or small experiences and making a series of stories. If I were to expound upon this, um, this next quilt, this is a crazy quilt, which was created by my great, great grandmother. So much that we can learn about in this little picture. So in talking about making a meaningful narrative, instead of saying, this is a quilt my great great grandmother made, you could talk about, well, what time was the quilt made? What tell what about the fabrics? These fabrics I found are actually created from flower sacks. So most likely it was created 1930-ish in the 1930s when they were specifically printing patterns on flower sacks when the flower companies found that people were using them to make their clothing from. So where did my grandma live? Uh, I wonder who taught her to quilt or what else did she pass on? What else did she like to do? So there are a lot of things that we can, that we can harvest from one little item. Memorabilia. This, this is a typewriter that my grandfather brought back with him from the battlefield in world war II, And this thing is, I mean, it's probably 50 pounds. So when I think of my grandfather having to, I mean, he was in, he was in England, he was in France, he was in Belgium and he was in Germany. So there's some story behind this. If he trekked this thing all across Europe and it's heavy, very heavy, it is a German typewriter, which I find very interesting. Also, it does have a serial number on it and it has a bunch of other information. So I could find out where did this typewriter come from? Who had it? Where was it? How did my grandfather run into it? What, what battle was going on? So there's so much that I could use if I, if I used this typewriter as a jumping off spot, as you can see. So these are things that you that you may have and you may not know what to do with. I know for years I've just had memorabilia laying around. But how much more interesting is that going to be if that typewriter has attached to it a story of all about it? Even how the typewriter was made or things like that that kind of rich just a simple a simple um item. This right here I have um this is my great grandfather's report card in grade school. And I just love it. So here we have the county 
We have his teacher's name. We have his age. We have where he lived, his parents. So as you can see, again, I can take so much from this one little document that I can expand upon. Photographs, of course, we know. Where was it taken? Who was it? Who took the picture? What was happening? So much. What was the era of when the photograph was? And just with photographs, I mean, I have a whole other class about photographs, but I just want to say, please make sure that all your photographs have information written on the back and go talk to your oldest relatives before they pass away so that you can know who these people are, because otherwise, again, they just get lost and no one knows who they are. This is a newspaper article about my grandfather, who was always a health nut. And this is a whole article about how he never had a Big Mac because he only ate healthy foods. And indeed, he really was this way. And so I was so tickled to discover this article about him in his local paper. So, so many things I could jump off from using this article. And then this here is a family Bible, which is a great, great grandmother's or maybe even three greats, but my aunt has this. And inside of it, it has names. It has a leaf that somebody preserved in it. It has a marriage certificate. It's just a beautiful piece of a family keepsake. And you can see that they really loved it and they really took care of it. This is a very old book and it's in good shape. So, so much that I could take from that object that piece of memorabilia and create a story from. Okay, church records. Now this is a specifically interesting church record. If if you can see it, it is a beautiful piece of memorabilia. It is a marriage certificate, but it's more of a decorative uh, memor memorabilia it's beautiful, but it has so much on there. It has who married them. It has the church. It has the witnesses. It has the date. It has who the bride and groom are. So, so many things. And it would be really fun to maybe get a history on the church that published this. And how, how did they do that? Wow. This, I mean, it's just really beautiful and I love it. Of course we have here letters which can be, again, the direct narratives that we could maybe embed in another story or just expand upon it as it is by adding pictures maybe or other little details. Here's of awards and programs. So I'm thinking I have a bunch of funeral programs in my little keepsake box from relatives. So that's when I'm thinking of programs, I'm thinking of that or maybe a theater event, a musical event, maybe an award ceremony or something like that. Uh, this is a bronze star that my grandfather gained in World War II. And I'm really glad that I got to talk to him about it because otherwise it's, it's really hard to figure out exactly why a person got an award, but there is a story behind this. And so that would make a wonderful narrative. And then we have landmarks and maps. And this is this is a map of the lake that my father grew up on. This is Eagle Lake in Edwardsburg, Indiana. And it's really fun to find old maps and look at who lived there. And you can find land maps of who owned what. And I know that um, some of my family lived near each other. So it's maps are just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay, so again, those were jump off ideas. And so our first, uh, your first object is to choose what are you going to narrate about? What jumps out at you? What seems interesting? And as you go through this process, it's really interesting. You start seeing, oh, that could be a story or that would make a really interesting story or, oh, I want to find out more about that because that is very interesting. So once we choose the story, we have to choose how are we going to format our story and then how are we going to record it? 
And by format, I mean, are we going to make, maybe if we're doing a direct narrative, are we going to just maybe add a few pictures and a few little tidbits into that direct narrative? So, you know, we might make a photo book about having the direct narrative and pictures along with it. Uh, We might just write an essay about something, just write down the story. We might decide to do some artwork. So wouldn't it be interesting if you're a quilter, maybe having a story in mind, creating that through artwork, and then of course, writing it up so that it has meaning. And so that there is narrative attached to that piece of artwork, a children's book. And I talked about a photo book and a children's book is what I'm going to show you that I did uh, for my example. And then we have our recording ideas. So some of us, I, I know that I, sometimes I really do enjoy pencil and paper. And so if that is how you like to do things and need to do things, then that's fine. But I still encourage you to somehow digitize it because it's really important to be able to share with others. And digital is the easiest way to do that and easiest way to ensure that it stays accessible for others. So you can use a Word document. I love using Google Slides personally. To me, that's just a really easy easy thing to navigate, an easy way to create. I know a lot of people like Canva. So you have to decide how you want to do it. And again, if you're feeling like I am not computer savvy, that is way beyond my reach, then pencil and paper is great. Just make sure that you capture pictures of it so that it is digitized. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about where to put those digital copies. Okay, so then we're going to research. We have our story. We figured out, okay, I am going to make this in Google Slides and it's going to be a children's book. Now I'm going to research about it. So I am not just going to willy nilly start going on like, all right, I'm just going to hop in there and start learning about random things. Um, I'll show you the process that I used and I feel like it's a really nice methodical, easy way to do it. So you're going to make your plan. You're going to perform it. You're going to find things out. You're going to record them and you're going to put flesh on the bones of your story. And so again, I'll show you how we did that. Remember as you research the basic questions, who, what, why, where, when, those are really a great starting point just to figure out what you need to research. And also they're just really satisfying to find out the answers to those and to be able to share. It helps your story become more logical, um, more accessible, more interesting. So some of the things that I like to think about are economics, geography, time period, local history, and everyday details. It's interesting to me, the everyday details in a person's life. So I add those into the stories. Now we're going to talk a little bit about sources. It's really good if you are a genealogist and anything you're doing to cite your sources. (laughs) I've taken a lot of classes about how to write a genealogical paper. And I promise the biggest problem for everybody is how do I cite my sources? What format do I use? How do I make sure I've got everything done correctly. Well, in my experience, basically all you want to be able to do is get back to the source that you used. Or if you hand your your narrative to someone else, that they can find that so that they can see that, yes, you are saying valid things, things that are true, things that are backed by facts. So I like to cite sources as I go. If I find a book that has something interesting, I'll write down the information for the book. Or if I am researching Google, I will write down the website. Um, If I'm talking to a family member, I write down who told me that. Another great source to use, I have found uh, historical societies are wonderful. I, I had a lot of help from a historical society and specifically with this narrative that I've done talking to the people there who could search their records and tell me things that I did not know, not having been to the area. So that's a good thing to remember. But also 
always be sure to cite it. And it doesn't even matter if it's correct. As long as you write everything that is on a, you know, on the the title page of a book or take a picture of it, embed that into your document, that can be your source. So just make sure that you do that. It does give it credibility and it helps you be assured that you are doing your due diligence and that you are making sure that your story is as close to the truth as possible. Okay. And then the next step is to refine. So you'll see that you may get a story done, a narrative done, and you feel like you're pretty good. And then you realize, oh, okay, I've got some typos there. I've got some grammar things. This sentence is a little awkward. Um, The biggest tool that you have here is to have others proofread for errors and content. And honestly, this can go on forever and ever and ever because pretty much any person that you give it to is going to have a little bit of a different opinion about, well, I think this could be better. Maybe say this or say that. And I finally, after doing this over a period of time, had to say, okay, enough. I have to feel good about this. This is my work. When I feel good about it, then then it's re- I'm ready to move on because really you can get kind of held up here. Also to know that perfection isn't expected, but we we do want these to be professional and to look nice and to read nicely. Um, but again, more important to get something out there and to get these stories presented and available rather than making sure they're perfect. Okay, and then step five we have is to publish. So once we have our narrative all finished and as good as we think that we need, here are some ideas of how we can publish. So we can do a self-publish and this is something that I used. There are a lot of places online that you can do this where you just simply upload a PDF of what you've done. So I did mine in Google Slides, created a PDF, and I just submitted that to the publisher and they create a book out of it and then send you a proof. And then you go through that. I had to get a couple of proofs because I had, I even, even after I sent it in, I found some mistakes that I had to fix. So we can do that. That is a self-publisher. They, for instance, for what I did, that was really good because they made a hardback book. You could go to a big chain printer, maybe if you're just wanting to distribute it to your family and you don't need a hard cover format so that you can just upload to Kinko's, a local printer. This is just an example of some printers I found near me. So we have the BYU print and mail, and I think you can do that online and they will send things to you and they, they're really, they really do a great job. McNeil Publishing and Minuteman Press of Orem were just a couple of companies that I found. So if you want to go with a local printer, the good thing about that is uh, you can work directly with a printer. If, if you feel like your document is something that just needs to be really done beautifully. And um, they're really good about being a little bit more of a personal, giving a personal touch. Um, You can self-print with your own computer and printer. My aunt did that with both of my grandparents' family histories or their, their personal histories. They went out and wrote it. She typed it. And then she just went and made a bunch of copies and gave them to all of us. And they're the most valuable, one of the most valuable treasures that I have. So that is great. Now, digital. I am going to remind this and get this in your ear. Always have a digital copy. Again, if you're a paper and pen person, take a picture and put it somewhere that everyone can find it. I suggest family search and ancestry or sharing a file. But even if you're sharing a file, I always suggest to put it on family search as a memory because no one else can touch it. That is some great free storage space. And if you have a story about an ancestor, then other people who are related to that ancestor that you may not even know will have access to it. So see, there you have that person. They're always going to be alive through their stories. 
and narratives that you have put in an available place. Ancestry is also a great place. So I have accounts on both of those sites and I like to share on both of the sites. Um, They have different users and it just makes it accessible. So that's our whole point is we want to keep people alive by telling their narratives and stories. Okay, the next is to share. So we're going to print and distribute copies. You're going to publish on Family Search and Ancestry and then notify the people that are interested in this. So for instance, the book that I made. So here, here I've got my book right here. I've printed this. This is just my my copy, but the family that I did it for, they ordered 50 copies of it because they are using it to give it to all their relatives for Christmas. So anybody that's related to the story, to the people in the story, they think are interested in them. So that's a really good thing is to make it available for others. Even if you have to, um, not necessarily that you have to actually create a book and buy every copy of the book to give to people, people can get their own copies, but just make sure that it's accessible and it's easy for them to get one. Okay. So I am going to show you how I have done this and I'm going to have to go kind of quickly here. This is a story that was on a family search. And as I read this little story, I just thought, That is such a sweet story that would just make such an interesting book. And so it's about a family in um, Oklahoma. And I do have a client that I, she's just great. And I said, I think this would make a great story. I'd like to make a story out of this for your grandkids. And so she was, she was game for it. So this is one of my, um, this is probably my biggest project that I've, I've done with this, but I'll show you what you did. So this is my subject. Again, I am going to let you, if you're interested in reading it, you can look at my slides after the presentation because we're, we're kind of, you know, short on time here. So the second thing I chose my format and my medium. So as I said before, I used Google slides and then I decided that a children's book is going to be the best way to present this. So I chose my format and my medium. Then I researched. So I'm getting in a minute, I'm going to show you a little bit of a detailed breakdown of how I did research, but who, who was this story about? It was the Dyer family. They were farmers who lived in the same area, a few generations. They have parents and six children. And then I found out all the names. So where this was in Bakchito, Bryan County, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, on the Dyer family farm and Big Creek and the Hollywood movie theater. And then what was it about? It was an adventure tale of Don, the youngest of the six Dyer children and the lesson he learned about the strength of family ties. So in other words, that was the moral of the story. Why? To help the reader get to know the family place time period of the Dyers. Okay, so here's what that looks like as I broke this down. So I am just taking a few lines from the narrative that I found on Family Search. So it started out like this. As a teenager, I was finally allowed to ride my used bike and go to town with the older boys, a four mile trip to go to the movie. Pretty basic sentence, right? But as I broke it up, I could glean so much from it. So as a teenager, well, when was he a teenager? And I found out it's in the 1940s. How would a teenager feel at that time? I was finally allowed to ride my used bike. Why did he have a used bike? What kind of a bike did a kid have in the 1940s? And then I put his parents cared for him because it's interesting how he said, I was finally allowed to ride my used bike. And so obviously they had not let him do this before because he was too young. His parents were obviously um, cared about him. And so I, I just kind of took that. I gleaned that. I inferred that from the line, even though it wasn't actually in there and go to town. So where did he live? He was in rural Oklahoma. Where, where was the town? Which town was he from? So a lot of this, I was able to go look up 
through the historical society of this county, I was able to find, or they found and sent to me a map of the area and showed me where the farm was located. They were able to show me newspaper articles about the family. So, so much information. Okay. So he was allowed to go to town with the older boys. Who were his brothers? How much older were they? So I did a little research. I found out who the brothers were. I found out their names. I found pictures of them all to see what they look like. And he said it was a four mile trip to go to the movie. Okay. So obviously he went into a bigger town than his little rural farm. So what was four miles away? What would that movie theater have been? And again, through the historical society, I found one of the one of the workers there went and looked and said, oh, four miles away, there was a town that had the Hollywood movie theater. And I can see that in the 1940s, that was the only theater that was open at that time. And it was four miles away. And so I'm pretty confident that that was the movie theater that the boys rode their bike to. So you can see as we take little pieces of the original story, we can expand on it and make it so much more interesting and find out so much that is lying underneath. Okay, so step four, we are going to check for typos, have others proofread it, check and recheck. Again, this takes forever and, and you know, do your due diligence, but then there finally comes a point where you have to say, oh, I have done this enough. So refining is really important, but don't get too caught up on that. And then we have publish. Okay, so I published through using a, a book, a self-publisher. So this is Barnes and Noble Press, and I really liked them. I just showed, I'm just showing you right here what my order looked like when I went to order my book. So this is, again, I uploaded my whole document and they look at it to make sure there's nothing crazy going on. And usually you just order one copy and you get it to look at it. And I had, sure enough, I had more things I had to fix on that. But I, I just want to point this out. It doesn't have to be like a big budget money type thing. Look at this book, 894 So $8.94. And you can see, I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful book. So just letting you know, you do not have to spend a lot of money on this. Okay, here's me holding the book. I'm sharing it. So that's very, very important. Okay, I'm going to show you really quickly the book. This is the final uh, copy of it, but it does not look as good on my Google slideshow as it does in person. I mean, it turned out really beautifully. But also to let you know, this is kind of a cool way I have a, we have a really close family friend who served as the illustrator for this story. And it was really fun to work with her and she did a beautiful job, but you may have a son, a daughter, a grandchild, uh, somebody maybe in your family who is artistic. And if you want to use that and kind of get them involved in the story, then that is a really great way to kind of get to know each other and get to know your relative as you create a story about them. So I'll just show you some of the things that I found. This right here, again, you can go back and read the whole story if you're interested. But on this farm, they grew cotton and peanuts. And so we have the cotton and the peanut plants. Again, this is a little wonky. My, my paper copies a lot better. But we got a picture of the farm so that we could paint, have a painting of of the actual farm. This, you can see, I have added some things. So we know he lived out in a rural Oklahoma area and there's a lot of wide open space out there, isn't that? And I can imagine, I know what it felt like to be a kid. Like you want to get out and ride your bike. He was so excited. I know that he yearned for a bicycle before he, before he even got that bike. So he was given a used bike and he was finally allowed to go with his brother. So you can know just through the few words he said. So this is, I investigated, this is the kind of bike a kid would have had in the 1940s. So again, 
it's inferred, but also pretty realistic because I really did a lot of good research on it. Okay, here's the Hollywood movie theater. I looked up what kind of movie would have been going there at this time. This is one movie that they did show at the Hollywood movie theater. So I don't know if that's the one specifically he saw. There were a lot of Westerns. And I know each brother, there were four brothers. They all had red and reddish hair. And so I love this picture of these four little boys looking at the Western movie. So this is them on their way home. You can see it's gotten kind of dark. The whole story is that this, this kid was a lot younger than his brothers. And so he got left behind. And so his chain fell off of his bike and he's just despairing because he's in this, by this dark Creek and it's just scary. And he, he can hear all kinds of sounds. So I was thinking about that, something that would make this really interesting for children. So this is something obviously totally not, I don't know if he was thinking about these things, but I added to the story is the animals. So I researched on which animals would have been in Bakchito County by Big Creek. I was able to find a map of the creek and find writings from naturalists that talked about the animals because how interesting for children. So then I would take for instance, I know that there was there were giant bullfrogs there. And so he would have heard giant bullfrogs because he said he heard all these sounds. There were cottonmouth snakes and there were turtles. There were white-tailed deer. So the whole end of this story is, and the moral of the story again, is his brother comes and he rescues him. So here is his brother rescuing him and... I love in the story that he writes, I don't think I ever told my brother how much I appreciated him rescuing me. He had come back for me when he realized I had fallen behind. And so I just imagined how that must have felt to that boy to be rescued by his older brother, his hero. And this is something that he wrote is that my hero, Gene, will never know how much his rescue meant to me. So these are just things that, I, again, I inferred, but we have as the soft winds whispered through the fields of Bryan County, Oklahoma, the bond between brothers grew stronger. And we know I can infer that from the story, that this was really a big thing. His brother was his hero who rescued him. So it's I just loved that. So this is a portrait that we did of, oops. Sorry about that, everybody. I'm having issues. Okay, well, I'll just show you this. So this right here, oh, there I go, there I go. Okay, again, the original story. Here we have the family. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting for them to see a family tree of this family? So we found pictures. Here are the parents right here. This is the main child in the story. This is his hero brother over here. So that was really fun to do. And how interesting for those little grandkids to look at. And this is a beautiful picture of just look at those little, those little, oak, those little oaky kids. That's what uh, the lady that I've been working on this with, she's like, well, we're okies. And so I just thought that is so cute to put that on there for those kids. Okay. This is the land map that I found. And you can see I've got circled right here where their farm was. And so that's really fun to have. This is a little bit of an investigation I did about where the family lived in Bakchito, Oklahoma. And Bakchito actually means Big Creek, which is what the story was about. So it was kind of fun to learn that as I, as I researched where this family lived and what their life would have been like. This is more of a history. And these are my sources. So as you can see, again, they are not totally perfect, but anybody that really needed to could find those sources. So whether they put that into, into their Google search bar or write a letter or just look up, you could find out where it is. Hey, this is my bibliography for this presentation here. So some of the things I've got, where I got the studies from, the paintings that were used as background and such are also cited. So that 
in a nutshell, and I know I could honestly teach probably five classes about this subject. That was a lot. Thank you, everybody. And again, we will, I will put this, uh, the slides up. Um, it'll, it usually takes a couple days um, and you can find them in our archives, our Sunday class archives. And if you want to learn any more, you are free to contact anybody at the library. Okay. How to start. Okay. I have one question here, Shauna, how to start when overwhelmed with family items. Wow. First of all, that's a, Shauna, that's such a great, that's such a great problem to have, isn't it? Like I have too many things. Just start small or start with something that you know about. Like, what do you know the most about? I suggest starting there with what you know the most about or something that you love. You know, is there a family item that you have that just really speaks to your heart? That That is something that is a good place to start. So thank you. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, Cheryl's asking, I loved how you seeing how you research for the story. What sources do you use if you don't have an artist? Oh, that's a, okay. That's a great question. That is a great question. Okay. I will tell you, I usually will just go online. So for instance, I don't have an artist, but let's say I wanted to find a picture of a frog. So I, a bullfrog. So I would just go on and I would look up bullfrog illustration, copyright free or bull bulldog illustration free a lot of times. And they will have websites that will just have tons of clip art and illustrations that are either public domain that, that you can use for free, or you can actually buy, you can also buy copyrights of clip art, which it's not really that expensive. I think it's a membership to some places and you can use all of the things that they have. But even if, even though it were free, for instance, in this presentation, I used a, a painting as a background. And although it's public domain, because it's old enough for that, I still cited which painting it was and the artist. Thank you, everybody. Um, this has been really fun. I know, again, it's been a lot of stuff <laughs> in a very short time. And, and really, this probably took me, you know, some months to do. And I hope that you all have a great time with it. I really, I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoy the stories and the value that they add to us in all of our lives. So thank you, everyone.